All right, everyone. I think it's time to get started. So hello and welcome to the CTRC's Telehealth Summit webinar series. My name is Kathy Chorba. I'm the Executive Director of the California Telehealth Resource Center. It is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Fry and Jeremy Shearer of Hooper, Lundy, and Bookman. Andrea and Jeremy have agreed to join us today to speak about navigating the telehealth landscape, pressing legal issues in telehealth. But before we get started, I'd like to remind you of a few logistics. All of us are, in, are going to be in listen-only mode. Uh, please use the Q&A functions on Zoom at the bottom of your screen for questions and comments for the speakers and use the chat at the bottom of your screen on Zoom for questions regarding technical or logistical concerns. And this session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. The recording and the presentation slides from this session will be made available on our website, probably by the end of this week. Thank you so much for joining us and let's get started. Thanks so much, Kathy. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Jeremy Scherer. I'm uh, one of your co-presenters today, along with my colleague, Andrea Fry. Um, I guess it, before diving in, uh, well, first I should explain what on earth this, uh, this slide is with this wonderful blue atom looking thing in front of you. Um, our, our firm uh, is uh, based in California, but we uh, operate across the country in all 50 states. I, for instance, am in our Boston office, and we've been tracking uh, federal and state developments related to COVID-19 that are uh, relevant to healthcare providers and uh, keeping track of them on the website that is in front of you. Um, we know that the folks at uh, CCHP and, and elsewhere have been doing a, a great job doing so as well. So this is not meant to uh, replace that by any stretch, um, but it is uh, a helpful resource. So we just wanted to make folks aware of that. In terms of what we'll be talking about today, and, and I suppose before that, actually, Andrea and I should probably introduce ourselves. Um, so as I said, I'm uh, a healthcare attorney in our firm's Boston office. Um, Andrea and I co-chair our firm's digital health practice. Uh, the firm is a, a national healthcare boutique. We only represent healthcare providers. Um, in the digital health space, we work with, uh, we work with a lot of providers, a lot of health systems, a lot of SNF chains. Um, uh, medical uh, practice groups and others um, to kind of get their telehealth programs either off the ground or help keep them in compliance with the law. We do uh, healthcare tech transactions involving telehealth quite a bit. Um, and we, while we represent some startups, we also represent uh, several of the largest uh, telehealth platforms in the country, uh, some of whom are publicly traded. So there's sort of the full range there. And as far as what I do, Specifically, um, I, I tend to touch most things at our firm that have to do with digital health. So working on regulatory compliance issues, uh, business transactions, um, the full range of scope of practice and uh, corporate practice and medicine issues, um, and then a lot, of, uh, a lot of reimbursement as well, um, in addition to counseling on federal and state fraud and abuse laws. Andrea, do you want to quickly introduce yourself before we dive in? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. And hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Jeremy noted, I'm based out of the San Francisco office of HLB. Um, my practice is relatively similar to Jeremy's in that I predominantly focus on transactional and healthcare regulatory matters um, and have a particular emphasis on issues around health privacy, digital health, licensure and certification, scope of practice, and med staff issues. Back to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Andrea. So, um, I want to just sort of go over broadly what we're going to be talking about today. And, and at the outset, you know, we we know and we uh, we viewed the presentation that our friends from uh, another law firm, Foley and Lardner, did a couple of weeks ago on uh, some telehealth legal issues as well. We've done our best to try and sort of uh, divide up the landscape, and, and we're going to do our best to make sure that there isn't too much repetition. But inevitably, there will be a little bit of overlap. So uh, we apologize to the extent that any information has already been presented. Uh, but what we're going to focus on here is first coverage and reimbursement, everyone's favorite, uh, sometimes treacherous topic. Uh, we'll be talking about largely the Medicare program and what CMS has done in terms of uh, waivers and expanded services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but we'll also talk about the uh, 2021 physician fee schedule proposed rule and what sort of changes we're seeing come down the pike. Um, uh, 
We'll also talk about telehealth in the long-term care space specifically, because as anyone who has spent any time in the uh, long-term care post-acute uh, world knows, things there, uh, just as in telehealth as opposed to in-person care, are usually just a little bit different. There are little tweaks there that we want to go through. And then uh, I'll send it over to Andrea, who's going to talk about uh, telehealth prescribing issues, and in particular those involving controlled substances, uh, and talk about fraud and abuse and privacy, as well as some uh, sort of general scope of practice considerations. And then we're going to go into uh, some sort of actionable steps that we uh, encourage our clients to take and, and work with our clients on to, uh, to develop a, a compliant telehealth program, or once that program is developed, to keep it in compliance um, and just share some, some best practices and tips. So with that, I think we can dive in. So as we sort of dive into the discussion of, uh, of the Medicare program of uh, the COVID-19 waivers and sort of understanding where we are, this, this slide is really here for purposes of reference for folks because it is, uh, it, it, it's confusing to keep track of the different waivers that are in place and how they interact with one another. What is important to note is that uh, what makes these waivers, part of what makes these waivers effective right now, I should say, is that uh, you have waivers uh, in place. You have a public health emergency that has been uh, announced and remains in place uh, that was uh, initially put in place by the president, uh, as well as the uh, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Both of those uh, proclamations and, and waivers of, of applicable law that come with them need to be in place for the waivers that, uh, that CMS has issued uh, to be effective. Um, and it's also important to note that as medicine is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis, so to uh, telehealth laws change on a state-by-state -state basis, and whenever a provider is rendering services to, uh, to a patient, they're subject to the laws of the state in which the patient is located, and that's relevant here because it's important to look on a state-by-state -state basis at the waivers of various scope of practice requirements that are currently in place across the country. Um, every state has done something to relax their, uh, their requirements for out-of-state practitioners providing services via telehealth. Um, they've all done so in their own unique and, and different ways. So it's important to look at that on a state-by-state -state basis, and it's also important in addition to these uh, to the, the federal announcements regarding the uh, public health emergency to ensure that you're staying on top of the status of the public health emergency uh, at the state level in the state where uh, where a patient is located, because that can have uh, really serious ramifications as well. It's a, it's a puzzle, and you need each of those pieces. Um, next slide, Andrea. So. Before we dive, really dive in, uh, I wanted to kind of set a, a, a baseline, if you will, and a, thinking back as, as hard as it might be uh, to pre-pandemic, pre-COVID times earlier in the year, um, we have to remember that historically, Medicare telehealth services under, uh, under standards that are uh, set forth in the Social Security Act and have been in place since the late 90s, uh, Medicare telehealth services are only covered when these five requirements are met, that the patient is located at an eligible originating site facility, that facility and the, therefore the patient are in a rural health professional shortage area, a rural HIPSA, unless of course an exception applies. The service rendered needs to be on the list of approved Medicare telehealth services. The service needs to be rendered by an approved type of provider and the service needs to be furnished via synchronous audio video communication which is a technical way of saying uh, live uh, audio, video, face chat, something like Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, et cetera. Um, next slide, Andrea. So now transitioning into the pandemic, um, we're gonna go through the ways that CMS has uh, under authority granted by, uh, by Congress, the president, um, really chipped away at each of those requirements uh, in different ways. So the first and the thing that everybody noticed right away as soon as the, the uh, waivers were announced was that uh, during this pandemic, Medicare telehealth services can be provided to patients wherever they are, even in the home. They don't need to be located in rural areas. They don't need to be located in specific types of provider facilities. That 
is a is a big deal in uh, in the telehealth stakeholder community. Um, CMS also greatly expanded the services that it will cover as Medicare telehealth services for the duration of the pandemic. We're going to talk in a little while about what that's going to look like moving forward and, and how much of that progress we think will realistically uh, remain in place. Um, normally, services need to be rendered via live audio video technology. Uh, that has been waived, as I suspect most on this call know, CMS has uh, added certain audio only codes to the list of Medicare telehealth services for the duration of the pandemic. And uh, they uh, also, between the first and second interim final rules that CMS issued in the pandemic, they, uh, they upped the level of payment for those services. They, there was a long discussion in the, in the second interim final rule about how they uh, weren't aware that folks were going to rely on these audio only services uh, in place of traditional in-person medical visits nearly as much as they did. And when they realized that through the office hours calls and other things they were doing to engage with stakeholders, they, uh, they increased the reimbursement there. Um, next slide. Uh, next, you know, we talked about the requirement that services be provided by an approved category of provider. That hasn't, that hasn't been waived, but what CMS has done is they've added certain providers to, uh, to the, the types of providers who are approved to furnish Medicare telehealth services. Um, one issue here, and, and by this point, I suspect most folks are already familiar with this, but very early on, there was, there was some confusion back in March surrounding the notion that, um, that an announcement came down saying that uh, Medicare was no longer enforcing its requirement that providers be licensed uh, in the state where the patient is located for purposes of Medicare reimbursement. And that's true, and that is something that is within Medicare's authority to do, and it is something that CMS did. But what's important to note is that state law still applies. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, medicine is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. And so it is the state where the patient is located whose rules govern a, a medical interaction that occurs via telehealth. So even if from a, a Medicare reimbursement standpoint, the licensure requirement isn't being enforced, providers who are treating patients in a particular state are still subject to uh, the medical board or, or other professional authority uh, of jurisdiction in that state. So it's important to, to be mindful of that. Um, and for uh, purposes of the, uh, or for the duration of the pandemic, I should say, one significant development is the uh, addition of uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language pathologist services as, uh, as covered Medicare telehealth services, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Next slide. Uh, here, uh, we have a bit of a discussion on uh, originating site facility fees and, and professional fees uh, and how they've changed in some ways during the pandemic. Um, originating site fees can be billed when the patient is uh, located at the originating site when receiving treatment. So if the patient is located at home, for the most part, because the patient isn't at a hospital facility or another type of originating site, you're not going to bill an originating site fee because there aren't uh, the, the, the rent and the supplies and the different things that's meant to pay for just aren't applicable. However, folks are probably aware that CMS has permitted uh, hospital provider based departments to relocate to patient homes for the duration of the pandemic. And in that situation, because the, uh, because the patient is at the originating site as the home is a part of the provider-based department, it is appropriate to build the originating site fee there. Um, CMS has also allowed clinicians to bill the uh, originating site fee based on the, uh, the, the site the category, which would have applied but for the PHE. So if a service normally would have been provided in a, uh, a medical office setting, but was not because of the pandemic, CMS has said that providers could still bill the place of service code for that medical office. Next slide, please. Now, in, in sort of looking forward and figuring out uh, what we think this landscape is going to look like after the pandemic, um, CMS had it before the uh, physician fee schedule proposed rule came out for 2021. CMS had said that it was going anchoring around the edges, but that it was well aware that the Medicare telehealth services requirements are statutory. They are set forth in the Social Security Act, and as a result, they can only be modified through an act of Congress. So 
some of what CMS has done in the past few years, you know, looking back to the uh, communication technology-based services uh, designation, for instance, allow, which allows uh, virtual check-ins to be, to be covered and paid for, um, you know, they are, they're sort of getting to the, the outer limits of their authority and what they can do under the current, um, under the current framework. And so really uh, where the action is and where uh, a lot of us are expending our energy for that reason is at the federal level um, to, to have something done to work on those requirements in Section 1834M of the Social Security Act. Uh, but as far as what can be done and what we're looking at in the physician fee schedule for uh, 2021, there are limited providers. You know, we talked about uh, we talked about therapy services, so uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists. Um, you know, that is that's an area that has been uh, a thorn in our side for for a very long time. And during the pandemic, after some kicking and screaming, uh, I don't know if anyone on the presentation was on the uh, the, the um, CMS office hours calls that they held, but the this community um was was uh, very represented and uh cms changed its policy as a result and so ptot and slp services have been permitted during the pandemic now they have not said that uh that ptot and slp services are will be covered as medicare telehealth services necessarily moving forward but there are certain g codes for online evaluation services by these categories of clinicians who bill directly for their services which CMS is proposing to cover moving forward. Um, we're going to talk about long-term care in a little while, but while we're on this, I want to point out that this is, this is an issue in the long-term care community, particularly for skilled nursing facilities or SNFs, uh, and that has to do with the, the way that SNFs are reimbursed and that the, the Part A services that are covered are, are, uh, are paid for through a, through a bundled payment. And that bundled payment includes payment for, uh, for certain therapy services. And as a result, uh, and what, so what that means is that the SNF gets this bundled payment to cover a whole, uh, a whole range of services, including therapy services. And so when a PT, an OT, or an SLP uh, provides uh, services at a SNF, it's actually the facility and not the individual practitioner who bills for those services. So this is something for those in the, in the long-term care community to, to be aware of, and, and there is opportunity to comment on it um, by, I believe it's October 5th is the deadline for the uh, fee schedule proposed rule. Um, so that's the provider piece. There are limited services that have been added uh, for 2021. Um, you know, the, the many of the uh, expanded uh, types of coverage that, that we've seen during the pandemic have been uh, extended. Um, through the duration of the pandemic or the end of 2021. But in terms of services that, that CMS is proposing to add to the list of Medicare telehealth services on a permanent basis, there really aren't very many. Um, the main one of note is group psychotherapy services, um, which would now be covered. Um, there, there are a couple of services that have been added, which are, which are correctly described as, uh, as, as covering home visits by providers. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper and look into the commentary, they only apply uh, when services are being furnished for substance use disorder services. Um, so while some got very excited about that, um, you know, that's just a, a limited gain. Um, on, on the supervision front, um, CMS has said for the duration of the pandemic, uh, either uh, through the end of the PHE or uh, the end of December 2021, whichever is later, that uh, supervision, physician supervision can be provided via live audio video communication. That's something important to note. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about long-term care in a minute, but one important feature in the fee schedule that I think is important to, uh, to acknowledge is that for really the first time, uh, CMS is signaling an openness to talk about the role of telehealth in skilled nursing facilities. Um, like hospital inpatient services, um, there's been a, a resistance over time from CMS to uh, 
and, and they say that it's based on the, the acuity of the, of the patients who are uh, receiving services at SNFs and who are likewise in, in hospital inpatient departments, that they want to emphasize the role of in-person uh, face-to-face treatment and as such, the role of telehealth has been pretty limited. There have been frequency limitations on those services. Um, and, you know, as again, as we'll talk about in a moment, um, I, I think that it is largely through the experience of this pandemic and some of the changes that CMS was forced to make that it has seen that the role of telehealth uh, perhaps can and should be uh, expanded in SNFs. Next slide, please. Um, very quickly, you know, just like uh, the Medicare program, federally state Medicaid programs have also greatly expanded their uh, coverage and reimbursement of telehealth services during the PHE. Um, we're, ta we're talking about California now, you know, Medi-Cal is certainly no exception. Um, those issues do obviously change state by state, though, so it's important when crossing state lines to check the rules of the uh, state Medicaid program in that state, um, as they really do vary quite a bit. Next slide, please. And on commercial payers, uh, it's important coming out of the pandemic to be watching on a state-by-state -state basis what is being done in terms of payment parity legislation. Now, here we're talking about California where uh, beginning in 2021, there will be uh, payment parity on the books, which, is, which was a, a pre-pandemic development and something we're excited about. But it's important for folks in California who uh, maybe are providing services to folks across state lines to, uh, to track this landscape because there is a lot of pressure just as we're seeing in Washington on the federal government on state governments in many states that, are not, uh, that aren't as far along as California is and are uh, maybe they have coverage parity but not payment parity, or maybe they're, they're looking at, at parity provisions for the first time overall. Um, it's, it's important to look at and, and it's important to see where those parity provisions to the extent that they are being introduced, exactly where they apply because um, there, are, there are lots of carve outs that we're seeing uh, in states across the country. Um, next slide, please. So quickly running through telehealth and long-term care before I pass it back to Andrea. Um, Utilization of telehealth in, in SNFs and other post-acute settings has historically been really low. Um, you know, part of that is, uh, or, or I, I think a big, a big component of that is uh, lack of coverage, you know, like other healthcare facilities. Uh, most SNFs are not in rural areas, and as a result, uh, services furnished to their residents uh, via telehealth, or in many cases, are not covered. Um, this, just like in other sectors of the, of the healthcare landscape has obviously started to change during the pandemic. Um, but if you look at the sort of infrastructure for post-acute providers, there are issues that are a little bit different than other, uh, other uh, types of healthcare facilities. You know, the first goes all the way back to the Affordable Care Act and the meaningful use uh, issues and, and funds that were made available to hospitals and other types of uh, healthcare provider facilities um, to promote meaningful use of electronic medical records, which sort of uh, help to, to initiate the building of a general uh, healthcare technology infrastructure. And that, uh, that money was not made available to, uh, to SNFs and others in the post-acute community, or post-acute continuum, excuse me. Um, and as a result, many are just not set up to quickly stand up a, a telehealth network because they have there are a lot of steps that need to be taken before then to just have a, a competent and, and uh, functional uh, technology infrastructure in general. Um, and again, as I just talked about, you know, the, the geographic restrictions and, and issues for non-rural SNFs, you know, that's been a big problem. But at the same time, as we've seen during this pandemic, you know, there, there are certainly clinical reasons uh, pushing uh, implementation of telehealth programs in, in the post-acute space. But there are also plenty of opportunities for post-acute providers that I think are important to recognize. So when folks are, in, oftentimes, you know, telehealth can be used in a variety of ways in the post-acute context. Generally, the first step is for after-hours coverage where a physician is not on site. And if a patient or a, a SNF resident has a telehealth interaction instead of uh, going into the emergency room to, to have a, a condition checked out, you know, that will that can drastically reduce readmissions 
uh, to the hospital, which are particularly important um, because SNFs are now being under the SNF value-based purchasing program. Uh, CMS is withholding 2% of their uh, of their annual funding, essentially, um, and they can only earn that money back by demonstrating uh, a certain uh, no more than a certain level of readmissions. So keeping patients in place uh, can lead to serious benefits for these facilities. Um, you know, it's also important to note that those uh, transports are expensive, ambulance transports, as we all know, and they're also for this particular population, they could be dangerous. Um, and in addition to the fact that they are, that uh, keeping folks in place can uh, reduce unnecessary readmissions, um, it's also important to note that when folks stay in place at the SNF, you know, those are additional SNF inpatient days and an additional source of, uh, of revenue for those SNFs. So that's just briefly kind of the case for telehealth from a business perspective in, uh, in the post-acute space. And this is really something that we think should be, uh, that everyone should be watching very closely um, in, the, in the months and years to come. It's sort of the, the next frontier, if you will, and, and an area where we think there's gonna be tremendous growth in, in utilization of telehealth, um, particularly if uh, in the fee schedule final rule, CMS ends up, uh, as we think it probably will, um, adopting some changes involving frequency uh, limitations. Previously, you could only receive telehealth services as a, as a SNF resident a certain number of times per month, uh, for instance, and we're hoping that, uh, that those changes will, um, will come to fruition. Next slide. And last thing before I uh, send it back to Andrea, you know, I thought it, would, it made sense here to talk about some of the, uh, some of the things that CMS has done during the pandemic um, to increase uh, the utilization of telehealth in SNFs as examples of the sorts of things we can be looking for moving forward. Um, first, it's, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, these, uh, the frequency limitations um, previously uh, in hospitals and SNFs, you had uh, frequency limitations on uh, providing and billing for telehealth services. During the PHE, those frequency limitations have been waived, and it'll be interesting to see what CMS concludes about utilization as a result. Um, historically, at MedPAC and elsewhere, the, the big concern has been that uh, expanding coverage of telehealth is going to lead to a, a dramatic increase in, in utilization among, uh, among Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and we, at this point, we'll be able to see what the data says. Um, and then the other issue here is that in the hospice and home health space, there are, uh, there are recertification requirements that are needed to uh, confirm that a, that a patient continues to qualify for a particular benefit. And while that normally needs to be done face-to-face, -face, during the pandemic, that requirement has been waived and it's been uh, permitted to uh, provide those services via uh, synchronous audio video technology via telehealth. So that's sort of a wrap on uh, where we've seen CMS move during the pandemic, what might be coming next, and what we've been seeing um, in the SNF space and, and also what might be coming there and, and the issues that CMS is really asking about and, and weren't, we would encourage folks who are submitting comments to, to uh, give meaningful thought to these issues are, you know, do these longstanding positions regarding the importance of in-person treatment still make sense today? Um, you know, it's important to think about particularly in areas that are underserved and where it's difficult to staff uh, to get adequate uh, numbers of clinicians for coverage at facilities. Um, you know, telehealth can certainly expand access in that way. And also CMS wants to, wants to better understand the experience of long-term care providers using telehealth during the pandemic. So, um, you know, folks sometimes are, are shy to submit comments thinking that, you know, their, their experience must be redundant and that others are, uh, are, surely writing in um, sort of a, a tragedy of the commons type thing. Uh, please speak up if, if, you're, uh, if you're using this technology in the post-acute space um, and, uh, and interested in submitting comments to the uh, physician fee schedule proposed rule. Um, and that's all for me. Andrea, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. So I'm now going to be turning to focus on some of the other regulatory considerations to keep in mind uh, when using telehealth, both during the public health emergency and beyond. Um, so let's dig into prescribing issues first. And 
you know, under the Controlled Substance Act and specifically the Ryan Hate Act, which I'm sure most of you are already aware of, in order to prescribe a controlled substance, an authorized provider is generally required to conduct at least one in-person examination of the patient um, unless a specific exemption applies. And specifically, the Ryan Hate Act requires prescriptions for controlled substances be issued pursuant to a valid prescription, meaning one that's issued for a legitimate medical purpose in the usual course of professional practice by either um, a practitioner who has conducted at least one in-person medical evaluation of the patient or a covering practitioner. And so what do these mean? Um, an in-person medical evaluation refers to one that's conducted with the patient in the physical presence of the practitioner, regardless of whether portions of the evaluation are conducted by other health professionals. While a covering practitioner means one who conducts a medical evaluation that is not in person at the request of a practitioner who has conducted at least one in-person medical evaluation of the patient or an evaluation of the patient through the practice of telemedicine within the previous 24 months and is temporarily unavailable um, to conduct the patient now or to conduct the evaluation of the patient now. But um, obviously due to COVID, this in-person requirement has posed a significant barrier to treatment uh, with both patients providers sheltering at home and so in response, um, the DEA activated a public health emergency exception to the Ryan Hate Act back in March, which does allow providers to prescribe controlled substances via telemedicine without first conducting this in-person examination during the emergency. And so specifically, DEA registered practitioners may now pre prescribe controlled substances to established patients, either pursuant to a synchronous audio video examination or a synchronous audio only examination, i.e. a telephone call uh, during the public health emergency. DA registered practitioners can also prescribe controlled substances to new patients, but it has to be pursuant to a live audio video examination. So no telephone examinations for new patients. Um, if a practitioner is covering the patient of another practitioner during the public health emergency as a quote covering practitioner, he or she can conduct any necessary evaluation by any method, and so that includes both synchronous and um, by telephone. Uh, and then for purposes of the covering practitioner exception only, an established patient uh, is one whom the unavailable practitioner has examined in person or through the practice of telemedicine in the preceding 24 months. So the DEA recently further expanded this uh, controlled substances prescribing exception for authorized practitioners treating opioid use disorder patients. And in partnership with SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, it's now allowing authorized practitioners to prescribe buprenorphine, um, both to new and, and existing OUD patients uh, for maintenance or detox treatment on the basis of a telehealth examination. Um, and this can include a telephone voice only evaluation without the need for a prior in person exam. Um, as I referenced, this only applies to authorized practitioners, which means DEA registered practitioners who have met uh, certain qualifications and have obtained what's called a special data waiver from SAMHSA um, to prescribe buprenorphine without a prior in person examination. And the data here referring to the Federal, Federal Drug Addiction Treatment Act. Note also that the DEA and SAMHSA flexibilities only apply to prescribing and dispensing buprenorphine to newer existing patients. It doesn't apply to new patients treated with methadone or other controlled substances used in medication-assisted therapy. And, you know, just a general reminder to keep in mind, too, that this allowance remains subject to other limitations, including that the evaluating practitioner must determine that an adequate patient evaluation can actually be conducted over the telephone, and um, that any prescription also must otherwise be consistent with, you know, just the general standards of practice for a legitimate medical purpose and all other applicable standards of care. So, you know, and then this is important with any telehealth encounter, not just prescribing, uh, you know, really professional judgment should be guiding the provider's determination as to whether or not it's appropriate to treat patients via telehealth since you know, at the end of the day, it's just another way to deliver clinical services. So the standard of care applicable to an in-person treatment, you know, still applies in the context of treating patients via telehealth. You know, looking ahead as far as whether this flexibility will last beyond the PHE, I know, Jeremy, you've spoken with folks at the DEA, correct? Do you want to jump in and talk about that? Yeah, so this was this was 
pre-pandemic when I was last able to to touch base and you know for uh, folks who've been in the space for a long time the uh this this the exception to the Ryan Hate Act the uh telemedicine exception has always been sort of a, a an unknown and a black box because it's something that we've we it's there in the statute um but you know we've really never gotten any any confirmation that it's being worked on any sense of a timeline uh, except for you know sort of in, intermittent um isolated references and we were able to, to directly correspond with folks at the DEA, including those who are responsible for drafting um, the, the rule that would establish this exception. And we know that it's being worked on, which is a, a move in the right direction. But it, it was pretty clear that they are, are understaffed, they're overworked, and that this, unfortunately, is not a top priority. Um, it is something that they are working on, but they were also very uh, quick to note that, you know, if there is a change in administration, uh, that could that could impact this process as well. So what we are generally advising folks is that we think that this will will be handled uh, eventually. I, I'm sure folks saw, uh, I believe it was just yesterday or the day before, there was an article in, in the New York Times about um, about how effective telehealth can be in uh, in treating substance use disorder, which obviously involves controlled substances. Um, but this is not something that we expect to be remedied um, in the in the immediate immediate future, unfortunately. But that said, there is uh, you know, I'll, and you may have read about this proposed bipartisan legislation that was introduced back in June, um, and it's currently making its way through committee that could make some of these changes permanent um, and thereby circumventing the DEA's pretty lengthy rulemaking process. Um, it's called the, the TREATS Act, the Telehealth Response for E-Prescribing Addiction Therapy Services Act, and, and essentially would permit providers to prescribe controlled substances just in schedules three and four on the basis of a telehealth evaluation, uh, while also expanding Medicare's reimbursement of audio-only substance use disorder treatment services, where either an in-person or audio-visual audio evaluation of the patient has been conducted prior. Um, and while the bill largely was introduced uh, to support the use of telehealth in treating substance use disorders, it actually could have significantly broader implications because it's, as written, it applies to all Schedule 3 and Schedule 4 controlled substances, regardless of why they're being prescribed. Um, and then note, too, that under the bill, the telehealth evaluation would have to be provided via audio and video equipment, permitting two-way real-time communication, and would otherwise have to comply with uh, all applicable state and federal laws, which is sort of a good segue here um, that, you know, keep in mind certain state laws may still limit remote prescribing of controlled substances even more strictly than the federal government, and in some cases can prohibit um, it all together. So, so really important, even with these flexibilities at the federal level, uh, to keep state laws, uh, keep state laws in mind, both around controlled substances as well as non-scheduled drugs. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and focus on fraud and abuse. Um, Back in March, the OIG also issued guidance stating that it's providing flexibility for healthcare providers to reduce or waive caution for telehealth visits um, paid by federal health programs such as Medicare um, as a way to alleviate the financial burden of such services for uh, certain patient populations. Um, normally doing so would, would run afoul of federal laws related to, to kickbacks and inducements. So um, it's helpful to have this guidance and you know, that the services have to be provided during the public health emergency and consistent with applicable coverage and payment rules. And additionally, providers, you know, that are by no means required to waive copayments and deductibles and do remain free to, um, you know, still apply and collect these charges from beneficiaries. Uh, in the guidance, the OIG also indicated that the waiver of copayments will not be considered absent other evidence as an inducement in violation of the federal anti-kickback statute. So as an initial point, telehealth isn't by any means more susceptible to fraud and abuse enforcement action than any other form of healthcare services delivery. But you know, given the, its really recent rapid expansion, there's certainly going to be increased scrutiny from regulatory agencies as a result. 
And so just, just to give you a sense of how rapid the expansion has been during the pandemic, uh, CMS released data that telehealth visits increased from 13,000 per week pre-pandemic to 1.7 million in the last week of April. So uh, really just incredible. And, you know, I, I have a quote here from a blog written by CMS Administrator Seema Verma and Health Affairs, um, I believe back in June, basically stating that, you know, protecting beneficiaries and taxpayer dollars from unscrupulous actors is still vital for CMS. And, you know, as such, it, it, you know, it, it really is going to be monitoring the um, program integrity implications, such as practitioners who may be offering shorter telehealth visits with patients to maximize payment or billing more visits than are possible in a day. Additionally, Medicare telehealth services were highlighted in the OIG's work plan. So, so all this to say, you know, that there is probably increased scrutiny and enforcement actions around telehealth, you know, on the um, near term horizon. But that, that all said, you know, this increased scrutiny on unscrupulous actors using telehealth to commit fraud, it, it does seem in part to be a continuation of pre-pandemic trends, as you can see in the slide. Um, and, and an emphasis, emphasis here, too, on the bad actors, because much of the enforcement actions taken by regulators was really focused on, you know, pretty clearly fraudulent activities, such as, you know, call centers using telehealth to exploit vulnerable elderly beneficiaries. Ultimately, however, the, the current flexibilities by OIG aren't likely to last beyond the public health emergency. So it, it is pretty crucial uh, that you understand the rules of the road governing the provision and of and reimbursement for telehealth services. So for example, you have the federal anti-kickback statutes I mentioned earlier, um, the physician self-referral laws, Stark, False Claims Act, and uh, you know, other specific state laws as well. Um, so, you know, so that you can structure your telehealth arrangements to comply with any applicable safe harbors or exceptions, uh, just because failing to do so could lead to some pretty significant civil and in some instances even criminal penalties. Okay, so turning now to health privacy considerations. Uh, I'm Sure, you've all heard this by now too, but back in March, HHS relaxed some of the HIPAA uh, privacy and security requirements to help ensure um, that the provision of telehealth isn't constrained during the pandemic. Uh, specifically, HHS's OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, which enforces HIPAA, declared back in March that it will be exercising enforcement discretion and waiving penalties for violation under HIPAA. Uh, related to the good faith, and I emphasize good faith, provision of telehealth using non-public facing audio or video communication products. Um, and so this means that covered healthcare providers can use popular applications that allow for video chats, such as Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangouts, uh, Zoom, or Skype to provide telehealth without any sort of risk of penalty for non-compliance. Um, but you should not be using public facing apps such as Facebook Live, Twitch, or TikTok. Um, and th this exercise of discretion applies to all telehealth services, not just those that are uh, focused on COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you are a covered entity considering using alternative popular applications, it, it's important um, and OCR has encouraged that you notify patients that these third party apps could potentially introduce heightened um, privacy and security risks. And, and keep in mind too, that you do still remain subject to uh, the other regulatory requirements under HIPAA. For example, to implement reasonable administrative, physical and technical safeguards to protect your PHI. So generally speaking, it's, it's not just best practice to you know, enable um, available encryption and privacy modes uh, when using such applications. And, um, ideally, when, when doing so, you, you would still use technology vendors that comply with HIPAA and, and, and you know, that agree to enter into a, a BAA. Um, also, just a quick note, too, on um, substance use disorder records, specific to 42 CFR Part 2. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, or SAMHSA, hasn't waived compliance with Part 2 uh, for SUD treatment providers. But it did emphasize in um, guidance that the prohibitions on use and disclosure of SUD records under Part 2 would not apply in situations where a provider makes the determination that a bona fide medical emergency exists, preventing the patient's prior written consent to the disclosure of 
uh, his or her SUD info to medical personnel who may be treating uh, the patient remotely. And then separate from HIPAA, uh, keep in mind too that state law health privacy requirements still apply. Here in California, uh, there, you know, is after significant pressure from stakeholders, maybe some of whom are on the call, um, the uh, California Governor Newsom issued an executive order on April 3rd that essentially, you know, allows for more flexibility provider by providers using telehealth by waiving certain um, state privacy and security requirements under the California uh, Confidentiality of Medical Information Act and the Health and Safety Code. So, but at the end of the day, it's pretty similar to the waiver that was issued by OCR. Uh, you know, in, in terms of looking forward, the, the waivers both to HIPAA and, and various state level health privacy laws are most likely temporary. So it really is important that going forward, you have all the necessary safeguards in place to ensure that any telehealth services practitioners, your practitioners are providing, um, you know, can be rendered in a manner both that's confidential and secure, such as using an encrypted platform that is HIPAA compliant and, you know, with the, whom you have a BAA in place with that vendor. And just a reminder too, you know, there's no special section under HIPAA or any state health privacy law that's devoted to telehealth. So if you do use it and are a covered entity, you still need to make, meet the same requirements as if that service had been provided in person. Just a few more additional practitioner considerations. And I know Jeremy sort of got into this at the front of the presentation, so I'll be brief here. But, you know, we have been fielding a ton of questions about licensure. So it's, it really is important to keep in mind that states typically do require healthcare providers to be licensed in the state where the patient resides. Uh, many states have been providing flexibility, if not all, it sounds like, Jeremy, uh, you're more up on this, but by waiving the licensure requirement or providing a process for an expedited temporary emergency license, um, and that's actually what uh, we have here in California through EMSA, um, or granting emergency medical licenses like Massachusetts. Uh, and I've included a chart here that I, is super helpful. The Federation of State Medical Boards has been keeping track of these state actions. Um, and definitely would recommend checking that out to the extent uh, it's helpful. Now, looking forward, um, you know, these state licensure requirements likely won't go away post pandemic. So it really is important to ensure that your telehealth practices comply with rules of whatever appropriate licensing board, um, you know, applies for the practitioner who's delivering telehealth services. Uh, there is, um, you know, potentially depending on the on the state uh, in which the patient resides, there is the interstate medical licensure compact, which about 60% of states are have adopted. I think 29 in total, um, but California has not. Uh, you know, it, essentially, it, if you are in a state where um, that has adopted the IMLC, it, it basically offers this sort of expedited uh, process by which a practitioner can be licensed. Um, okay, so turning now to provider credentialing, just another point specific to practitioners, usually in hospital settings and the like, who need to be credentialed and privileged before providing services. Um, the Joint Commission has provided an FAQ that for practitioners who are already um, credentialed and privileged, who are at a specific hospital, who are now just providing services via telehealth, do not require any additional um, credentialing or privileging to do so. So there's no requirement that telehealth be delineated as a, a separate privilege. Um, and for any volunteer practitioners, the Joint Commission has stated uh, that disaster privileges can be granted. So just be sure to follow the your you know hospital's medical staff bylaws and the Joint Commission's emergency management requirements before doing so, as well as if applicable, the Medicare conditions of participation. Um, you know, also here, as, as far as credentialing, both the Joint Commission and, and Medicare conditions of participation do allow uh, medical staff the option of um, relying on credentialing and pr privileging decisions by distance site entities under specific conditions. But keep in mind under um, California law, it's uh, business and professions code 
2290.5H, I believe, that it does require the governing body of a hospital um, basically to rely on its, it says the governing body of a hospital may grant privileges and verify um, uh, credentialing applications for providers of a, um, but it has to be based on its own medical staff recommendation. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you can, you know, take info from a distance aid hospital, but in other words, you, you can't be, um, you know, must be uh, recommended by the hospital's medical staff specifically. You can't just rely on the credentialing decisions of a distance site entity. And finally, just a quick note on consent requirements. Um, both California law and Medi-Cal here typically require clinicians to obtain and document uh, a patient's consent, either verbally or written, um, before rendering services via telehealth, um, as well as do most other states. Um, and so in normal circumstances, you know, you'd have uh, basically a, a general consent protocol that specifically references use of telehealth as an acceptable modality for the delivery of healthcare services. Um, and then, but, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of any um, waivers in, in California here, uh, there was an order issued by Governor Newsom um, that did suspend California statutory requirements to obtain consent before the use of telehealth services. Um, as have some other states, but at the end of the day, it's still best practice to have um, consent documented in some capacity. Uh, and lastly, you know, just a, a quick point too, before providing telehealth services, just to be sure to verify that the, the malpractice insurance coverage for that practitioner, um, you know, do, does cover services provided via telehealth. Um, and if treating patients physically located in another state, uh, that the policy also covers services provided to patients in that state. And so with that, I'm now going to turn it back over to Jeremy to talk about telehealth compliance tools and tips. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I see that we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, and, and so we may only have limited time for questions, but, uh, you know, our contact information, both Andrea's and my own, is, uh, is in the slides. You can find us on our firm's website. Please feel free to reach out. Um, I would also note that this is uh, maybe my favorite presentation I've ever given in my entire career because with Rebecca here, it's like having a third presenter. I just looked at the list of questions that have been asked so far and she has been getting right back to everybody with a great level of detail. So thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, in terms of uh, tips for, for folks as you're building a compliance plan or, or uh, whether you're, you're doing upkeep on a compliance plan, keeping it in good shape. Um, everybody on this call knows telehealth isn't its own discipline. Uh, it's another way of delivering services, but it's important to note in, when, when expanding telehealth service lines or even just uh, looking back at your own practices, you know, it, using telehealth does uh, impact your operations and it, it is different. There are different things that you need to think about on a operational sort of nuts and bolts basis. So we really do encourage folks to implement telehealth specific compliance plans that address all of the legal considerations that we've talked about um, here throughout the presentation. Next slide. Now, what does that actually mean? Um, the types of things that we often encourage our clients to work on and that we, that we help with are, you know, policies and procedures that are specific to telehealth for the reason that I just outlined. There are differences in how things work on the ground when you're providing services via telehealth as opposed to in person. And it's important to have documentation of the, the good faith effort and the, the time and energy that's been invested in uh, developing those workflows and those uh, programs uh, in case, heaven forbid, you ever have any of those practices questions by a regulator. You know, when we get a call from a client that says that, uh, that OIG or uh, a state Medicaid program has shown up an auditor at the door and wants to see records, uh, the first thing that we often want them to, to have on hand 
aside from things that are specifically being requested, is there policies and procedures for telehealth? Um, as far as operational tools, you know, Andrea and I are attorneys. Uh, everyone on the call, I'm sure, has plenty of experience with attorneys. You know that we love to draft beautiful, flowery memoranda with all sorts of Latin phrases and italics and all the rest of it. Um, and, and Andrea and I are not any different than, than other attorneys who are like that. But what we find is that really short, concise, uh, readable, understandable checklists, charts, workflows, documents that are, that are actually designed for folks on the ground to be using them are extremely effective. So examples of that are we will help to create billing protocols that are specific to the payer. So when it, folks on, on this call know much more about, uh, about coding and, and claim submission than I do, um, but in terms of the laws that apply there, they are different when you're dealing with Medicare, when you're dealing with a private payer, commercial payer, I should say, or you're dealing with a state Medicaid program. So those tools should be different. Um, all of the practitioner issues that Andrea was talking about, uh, licensure and scope of practice requirements, what types of technology are approved to establish a practitioner patient relationship, figuring out when telehealth is clinically appropriate, documentation, patient consent requirements. You know, these are issues that, that need to be part of a workflow, they also can be different state by state in terms of what's required. So summarizing those requirements and having them available in a way that your, that your compliance team, that, uh, that folks who are working in operations at a facility, um, or on the flip side, if you're, in, if you're working in a payer environment and just on needing to understand um, what, what uh, requirements apply on a state by state basis, having those different documents addressing specific situations are really helpful. Um, from, from a facility perspective, preparing agreement templates specific to telehealth can be a tremendous time saver. Um, and it also ensures that you're not, uh, you're not caught in a situation where you, you don't have appropriate documentation and you don't have an arrangement set up the right way when folks are providing services uh, via telehealth. So that's really important. Um, doing training with anybody in the workforce working in or around telehealth on workflows and operational issues is another best practice that's really important. And finally, uh, specific to the pandemic, you know, we're, we're really encouraging folks to monitor the uh, timeline of the, of the COVID public health emergency, waivers that are in place to uh, state and federal legal requirements, um, and, and making sure you understand uh, the applicability of those waivers to what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, and I believe that's it, unless Andrea surprises me with another slide. Let me double check here, but I, I think it's just uh, our information. And like Jeremy said, definitely, you know, I, I think we're short on time, but please feel free to reach out to either one of us with follow-up questions um, or just to say hi. <laughs> so this is Rebecca, guys. I'm going to ask, can you hang out for just maybe five more minutes? To, there are two questions that I'd like to ask you guys after Kathy finishes her wrap-up slide. Sounds great. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so Andrea, if you can just flip over to the next slide real quick. I wanted to thank you for, for doing this presentation for us, Jeremy and Andrea. This is most excellent with lots and lots of information. And I know I'm going to be coming back to these slides several times just because there's a lot of information in there. So, and for everybody, uh, of course, you know that uh, these sessions are being recorded. And um, if you missed any of our previous events, you can always come to our website and view those events as well as the slides. This event will be up on our website at probably by the end of the day on Friday, if not sooner. And if you haven't already signed up for the last two in, in our Telehealth Summit webinar series, we may be adding more, but the last two that we have scheduled right now will be Virtual Technology Showcase with Doris Barta and Jordan Berg from TTAC, and also Bedside to Website, Optimizing the Telehealth Experience with Laura Orlin and Brittany Colonna from PWN Health. So please do join us and thank you for joining us today. And I will hand this over to Rebecca for the wrap up Q&A.
Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. So um, right now we only have one question in the Q&A, which has multiple parts. Um, I have a question and it's one that I get a lot. So I'm going to ask my question because it also does tie into the question in the Q&A. Um, so either Jeremy or Andrea, we get a lot of questions about whether the laws are applicable based on the state that the patient lives in normally or is physically in at the time of the visit. Uh, where this question comes up a lot that I'm getting it from is from colleges where students during COVID have gone home um, to their other states or, um, you know, have gone to visit parents in other states or whatnot. And so they might be California residents normally, but they are not physically in the state. Is there any light that you can shed on that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. It's one that we get a lot, and it is one of those questions that remains kind of a gray area. Um, the 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 short answer is that it's it's the uh, unless it, there are a couple of states which uh, specifically address this, and will say you know the state in which an individual resides. Uh, for the most part, it you want to be looking at the laws of the state in which the individual is physically located when uh, services are furnished via telehealth, and and the reason for that is. Oh no, Jeremy, I think we lost you. Uh, providing okay. medical services via telehealth, um, you know, it has to do with the state consumer protection interest, right? And, and state regulators and, and the professional boards want to know when an individual is treating people located within that state. Now, there are a, a range of exceptions which, uh, which can apply. Again, every state is different, but there are there are situations where, for instance, if a if a, in in your example, Rebecca, if a student is home from college and is receiving services via telehealth, um, but the the practitioner who's providing those services only does so a certain number of times in a given year, um, there are certain states where that is where that is permitted. There are certain states, uh, Ohio is one that I can think of off the top of my head, where if the provider isn't accepting compensation. For the uh, for the visit, um, then it's okay to provide it without a a license in that state. There are some states where all you need to do is fill out a form as a provider and notify the medical board that you're going to be providing services in that state. And as soon as it's processed, you can go ahead and do so. Um, there are other there are other uh, areas of the country where if you're located in a border state, the normal uh, the normal uh, state licensure requirement doesn't apply. So that's a long way of saying that it's a fact specific analysis and it's something that you need to look at on a case by case basis. Um, there is also a course that goes without saying the countervailing consideration that the clinicians who are who, who want to furnish services to their patients have um, quality of care and continuity of care obligations that they owe to their patients. Um, so it's a it's a difficult question and uh, one one that we deal with a lot. And uh, unless uh, we were talking about this in a firm meeting recently, um, Andrea will recall. You know, un unless Congress were to act and under its uh, interstate commerce authority um, claim jurisdiction over the practice of medicine in the entire country and waive state licensure requirements, this is something that we're going to need to continue to deal with. Um, you know, I, I have heard some discussions among uh, certain, uh, what should I say, uh, professional associations and uh, standard setting associations um, that have talked about establishing positions on this, which is something that we, of course, very much encourage. Um, but there, there unfortunately is no, uh, no short or quick answer uh, to that question. Awesome. That, that was an amazing answer for me anyways. Okay, so the question that's in the Q&A um, is, are there, so it's multi-part here, are there any new legal considerations for clinician supervision via teleconferencing, uh, for example, physician supervising an NP? How about supervising clinicians across state lines via telehealth, and do you recommend a state medical license in the state where the clinician practices? So... I guess I'll, I'll try to just speak to all of it sort of together, if that's okay. And, and folks should feel free to follow up if I haven't answered the, the specific question. But um, the first thing is that, you know, it, it is worth noting that in the current environment um, during the public health emergency, 
CMS has said that for purposes of the Medicare program, uh, supervision may be provided via synchronous audio video communication, uh, but that is uh, currently limited to the duration of the pandemic. Um, as far as uh, general principles on, uh, on that question, you know, this is a question of state law. Every state has different requirements. Generally speaking, if you think about it, you know, it, it's a, it, usually it's in a state medical practice act, uh, wh which will require a practitioner, uh, a, a uh, an allied practitioner, a non-physician practitioner to have a certain level of supervision. Well, the medical practice act in that state only has jurisdiction over providers in that state. So unless it's a, it, it, explicitly says otherwise, generally speaking, if a provider needs to have clinical supervision to provide treatment in a, in a particular state, I would, for, as a starting place, I, I would imagine that that supervision should be provided by a clinician who is licensed in that same state. Um, Rebecca, you moved the question, so I lost it now. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in the answered very last one. No, it's fine. I found it. Um, so, uh, super, and supervising across state lines via, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I kind of got the the gist of it there. Um, you know, it, state by state, there are rules about providing supervision via telehealth. Um, and if if a clinician needs to have supervision in a particular state, you know, it's something every state is different. So we would have to look, but in general, I, I would first look to being licensed in that same state if you're going to supervise there. Yeah, and, and I'm just going to jump in here too, definitely echoing what Jeremy said, uh, you know, at least in California too, for the most part, the physician doesn't need to be physically present to supervise an allied health practitioner, at least as far as, you know, for example, an NP or a PA. There have been with the, with the public health emergency, a couple waivers um, coming out of uh, Governor um, Newsom, basically waiving the um, the number of um, allied health practitioners a physician can supervise. So I think those, um, you know, are, are something to be aware of as having changed, but not necessarily related to telehealth per se. But for example, you, you know, previously a physician could only supervise four PAs or NPs and, and that has since been waived. Okay, thank you guys so much. And thank you for agreeing to stay a couple minutes later so that we could ask those questions. I really appreciate your presentation and um, you guys joining us. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing all of our attendees next week and um, hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Take care.